Okay, so let's go all the way back. Why figure skating? Was it something that you were pushed into? How did you realize that this was something that a sport that you really liked? Yeah, um, so my mom is actually a skater. Um, she grew up or she started skating later on in life. So um I did I did a bunch of things growing up, but then once my mom put me into skating, I really fell in love with it. I just did like the little basic little learn to skate classes and um really never looked back. I had the same entire like I grew up in the same group of girls and I had the same coach throughout like my growing up skating career pre-college so um I don't say like my mom pushed me but I think she's definitely happy that I chose skating so and then why synchro I know that that's Um, kind of like a an offshoot of a figure skating yeah so I really didn't know what it was um I didn't start that until I was like I want to say 10, but just through my coach back home, she started up a team. So it was just like natural for all of us girls to like do it. And I really like that aspect of the sport because um, in a sport that is so isolating and when you're competing against other girls and other guys and um, out there by yourself, Synchro offers that like team aspect and um that's why I liked it I don't know. yeah I mean normally when I bring athletes on they're either an individual sport athlete or they're a team sport athlete yeah. there isn't much crossover I mean there aren't really many sports that function the way that skating does in that regard what did you yeah. find about synchro that you liked that you didn't get from figure skating and vice versa um I think like I think it was, it was different growing up because I will say like doing college skating, I didn't feel like skating alone and then skating in a team was as isolating, but definitely growing up, I grew, I did skating more competitively by myself and then like the synchro was more recreational and then that kind of flip-flopped when I got to college. And so I think that team aspect and not feeling like alone out there on the ice was not as intimidating to me I was someone who like was an overthinker um had struggles with jumping and you didn't really have to do any of that in secret so I liked that um and it also just like built my skating skills a lot and like taught me a lot beyond the sport that I think I'll always like care and carry with me through life when you're looking at training for an individual sport like figure skating versus a sport like synchro, where everything has to be perfect, you're working with a dozen other girls. What kind of specifics do you have to get right from a team perspective? Well, um, you have to make sure like you're all on the same edge. You have to make sure that you're all intersecting at the exact point. Um, when you get into college skating, college synchro, um, and for me personally, I shifted from ISI synchro to like US figure skating synchro, which is based on like more of a point system. So you have to basically look as like your one, except your 16 girls, 16 guys and girls on the ice. And so you have to, one, put trust in yourself, but trust in your teammates that you're all going to do the same thing on the same beat of music. Um, So I think that's what makes Synchro so cool is like, and you look at the really good teams like the Haydenettes and you see them skate like so uniformly and you're just like, how is this possible? Yeah, I mean, was Synchro, were you determined to have Synchro as a part of your college skating experience? Um, If you would have asked me my junior year of high school, I would have said I was going to be done with skating past high school because I grew up in Texas. So really the skating opportunities back then and Synchro specifically wasn't very large. Um. 
And I then my coach back home said, you know, we really shouldn't give this up. I was like, okay, but, and then I started looking at schools that had skating only because I was like, I want to skate. Um, Now there's so much more to life than skating that I know now, but um, so I think that's like when I really started to take it seriously. It was like my senior year of high school and I was like, I want to pursue this through college. It would be fun to get four more years out of it, um, grow my skating abilities, reach some more goals. So yeah. What was it about the recruiting process that made you sure that where you ended up going initially was the right choice? Um, so I only went to Adrian once before I committed, which was um, the weekend of tryouts. And um, I only looked at a few schools. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do initially going into um, skating or college, sorry. And then, so I was like, well, I'll just go to the school in Michigan. They have skating for free, which was cool to me. Um, And I'll try it out. I, you know, I reached out to the coaches um, like way far in advance. And I saw a few other girls from Texas like going there. So I was like, okay, like I'll just go and give it a try. I was completely like blown out of water by like the extreme talent that all these like skaters were showing up with it was something that I didn't know what I was getting myself into because like skating in Texas and skating in the Midwest is just very different um these skaters grow up and breathe synchro and that's just not the type of skating I grew up in which is fine doesn't mean that you can't grow into like a amazing synchro skater but these skaters were skating for you know, all these big name teams, Starlight, Skyliners, um, you name it. So I think like I just had a really good, in my mind, tryout experience. And the girls that I talked to there, they were really comforting. I skated like really well. I put a lot of pressure on myself leading up to this trial. And then once I like made the team, I was like, okay, like I have to go here. Um, I didn't really look at any other option because once I was like, I can skate in college for free. I was like, okay, I'm going to Michigan. I'm moving to Michigan. So that's how I came to that decision. When did you start to see the coaching culture not pan out as intended? Um, I probably could have seen it early on. And now like looking back, I definitely like see red flags, but It was my sophomore year of college where I really started to see um, that I just like wasn't a good culture to for skaters to grow up and and I do say grow up because like you are growing in college and um, especially for someone like me like my parents sent me off to Michigan trusting like these coaches were gonna like protect me and um you know raise me in this like healthy skating environment and really like my sophomore year I just I don't know why but I just started taking a turn for like the worst um we just um we did like CrossFit which I just like never was a firm believer in for like skating purposes like I just don't think I think that it does provide some benefits but I just like it was just a lot for someone for like a lot of us who didn't really ever do that before um, going to Adrian. And then it was just like um, rigorous, like practice schedules and like endless amounts of comparison um, from the coaches. And like, you felt like you were competing against your teammates, which was something that I never wanted to experience. Like, yes, you're competing for, like, I guess a spot, but you're also, like, teammates at the end of the day, and you want everyone to do um, their best, so I started really getting in my head, started um, questioning if I was good enough, um, 
a lot of that was probably like self putting but because I was so terrified of the coaches um specifically the head coach um that I didn't want to mess up and so I did not mess up from my freshman year all the way up into a competition March 2020 or March 2020 in my sophomore year and I this was the freestyle aspect and the synchro wasn't as bad like mentally but I did not fall in a competition until that point um because I was so scared because I thought if I fell I wasn't going to be able to compete the next competition uh it was very competitive like who would get starts for competitions and once I hit like that breaking point I just knew like this is not how skating should be um especially growing up in a very healthy skating environment I think my coach back home did a really good job of raising us to not like uh compare ourselves to each other and like not focus so heavily like on body image and like weight and looking a certain way um so going from that to like the end of the spectrum where I experienced that Adrian it uh showed me that like it just took that to like me breaking down in my dorm room to like realize that I had to do something or I was going to quit skating and um be miserable yeah when we talk about toxic coaching culture it is normally in retrospect was there anyone telling you in the moment this isn't sustainable this isn't working this isn't how it should be yeah so I kind of started talking to like teammates that I like trusted and they were like oh my gosh like yeah I feel the same way and um then would like tell me more of like what they saw because I was on open collegiate for perspective which was like the lowest um team that Adrian had of synchro and they had collegiate and senior I had friends on senior like who had practices like five times a week and tell me like comments she would make during practice and like comparing or like saying things like this skater is so easy to lift because she's tiny and things like that and I was just like man like this is just like not not good and my intercollegiate coach my sophomore year actually confided in her and was like I just can't I'm so scared to skate in front of um the head coach and I am worried that if I don't rise up to these levels then like I'm never gonna skate I'm never going to like reach my skating dreams and I always wanted to like advance and like move up teams um I like wanted to move up to collegiate and I just wanted to keep pushing my skating boundaries and I remember having a meeting with like the coaches not the intercollegiate coach but the sinker coaches and they essentially like told me like no like you're gonna stay where you are like your whole collegiate career um which is fine but I just knew that there and there were so many other things on top of that um but I still talk to like a lot of the girls I skated with and um there's obviously like more and more unraveling as years go on but uh it definitely was not the only one who felt that way so it was reassuring to hear like okay it's not just you and it's not just like in your head yeah I mean it's interesting when when one person starts to to talk about things like this like mental health as a whole but specifics like toxic coaching culture and something that was said or a standard that was literally unreachable right it only takes one person to kind of start to unravel those conversations right when you started chiming in, were you being met with Me Too's? Yes, definitely. Um, and even more so than like what I experienced, like some of the 
some of the skaters who went through things there um it's heartbreaking like I never want another skater to go through that and like I'm so proud of Adrian and the culture that they're building now because they I think they have a really good coach who's coming in this season and I think she'll do a really great job of reshaping um, the culture there and I, I have a lot of respect for the skaters who skate there now um, and are working towards being this safe environment which every program and every skating team should be and unfortunately it's not like that but hopefully it is on that trend that way but there was definitely a lot of me too's especially once I did announce that I was transferring because it was hard I was trying to keep it secret up until we were done with the skating season so I didn't like get reprimanded for transferring but um after that I had skaters reach out to me who were well past my time skaters who had skated like four or five years ahead of me at Adrian reach out to me on social media be like hey I'm really proud of you for making the best decision for like your mental health like this is what I went through too and so it's just crazy because um I was scared obviously to make that choice but it has obviously I wouldn't be here today if I did it and um it's just really awesome to see like the community and like when you stand up and you use your voice like the power that I can bring and like other people aren't afraid to like share their story too when we talk about a combination of toxic coaching culture and a sport like figure skating that already is very specific about body image that can create body image issues that can create disordered eating and actual eating disorders I mean when you're looking at a sport like that how do you not fall into that hole how do you not say well the coach must know what's best for me yeah it's really hard um I never struggled with body image I'm like thankful that growing up in skating like I didn't struggle with that I never was like oh my gosh if I eat this bowl of spaghetti at dinner I'm not going to be able to skate the next morning or something like that and it wasn't until I got to college where I was like you know tracking what I what I ate you know weighing myself looking at myself in the mirror and like developing this like very toxic environment for myself because of all these stimulators coming in from the school and the coaching staff and it wasn't um like we had our like head coach husband he actually said to one of the skaters a moment on the lips forever on the hips and that will always stick with me and because like how can you not forget something like that and to tell a skater something like that when it's already such a toxic sport when it comes to body image um and you have these skaters who are trying to do everything that they can to please this coaching staff um it was just like beyond me when I heard that I was just like oh my gosh and it like obviously didn't help my own battles with body image either um so I think the key to not fall into that is obviously whoever your coach is and like it's hard because we have social media now and all these things where it's like endless amounts of comparison and you know there's that saying comparison is a thief of joy and it really is um it's comparing athletes, it's comparing, you know, six foot girls to four foot 11 girls, you know, who are a little bit muscular. It's just not the same body type. And like skating isn't like one size fits all. Like it is so much more than that. And like some of the strongest skaters don't have to be like eensy meensy tiny and like, um, 
you know, we saw like like a few years ago, like at Skate America, they had like an ad that was like very prone to like disordered eating. Like, and it's just like, we need to shy away from like, and it's just like the sport itself, like you're getting out there and you're, you know, getting in this little tiny, like sparkly dress and um, that's all like the judges are looking at. So I think it's hard, but I think it's where you grow up in skating and then like how if you do decide to pursue like professional skating or collegiate skating or whatever team you say whatever it may be it does come from your coaches because like who else are you going to turn to right if you have a coach who's telling you all these things you're like yeah like I need to listen to them like obviously like they know best they've been doing this a lot longer than I have so I didn't I didn't realize it was wrong until I did transfer to trying and like had a healthy relationship with a coach to where I like saw that what was I was experiencing wasn't healthy for like body image and eating disorders and like food and skating and all that what was it about trying that made you go in that direction um I instantly felt at home when I stepped onto that campus. I was very nervous, very scared to even go and uh, see the skaters, see the coach. Um, But I had a um, friend who I went to Miami camp with, and she went to Trine, and she was having a really great experience, and I kind of like lit her in, and I was like, having a really tough time at Adrian and I just need a new start and I need a healthy environment to like refine my love for skating and she was like well you can reach out to our coach and like the coach Rachel Franchock she welcomed me with like open arms listened to my story and was like my biggest thing is like I thought that the coach from Adrian took away like my joy for skating And Rachel told me, like, no one can take away your joy from skating because it's, like, deep-rooted inside you. And, like, no coach, no teammate, none of that can take away the joy. Um, It's just lost for a little bit. Um, And so after going there and having that conversation with her, I knew that that was going to be the place for me and... By then, I also had decided that I wanted to pursue physical therapy, and I knew try and had a program for that. So I was like, this was a decision I was going to make. And I had, like, a few selective teammates at Adrian that I had told uh, that I was doing this, and they were behind me. And then, like, I told my mom, and she was behind me. Um, so just having that support from you know, my little corner at Adrian, and then also, like, this welcome opening from trying, I felt confident going into that. Yeah, I mean, transferring is always a difficult process, because you never know if the grass is actually greener on the other side. Yeah. Was there any hesitancy? Of course, like, I was going from a well-established program Adrian has been around for a lot more years than try and had um it was only their first year when I was thinking of transferring so I was like I'm like I questioned if I was like making a strong decision for like my skating career um going from such a like well-established program to try and where it just had been one year but I was like, I'm not doing this necessarily for like my skating career anymore. I'm doing this because I need to save my mental health and I need to get out of this toxic situation and rebuild this uh, love that I had lost for skating. So with all of that, I was like, I want to take a chance on this school in Indiana and I don't care if I'm, you know, the 11th member of this team um, 
or whatever it was. I don't even remember. But um, I think I'm like number 13 or something like that. I can't remember. But I was like, I'll take a chance on that. And it looks like these skaters are having a lot more fun than I am in college and like with skating. And honestly, when you get to that point in your skating career, like you're doing it in college because you like want to keep pursuing the sport and you want to have fun. And that's what I kept reminding myself is that I wasn't having fun at Adrian. And like, I didn't like the school. And when you don't like the school and you don't like the skating program, it makes it really hard to want to enjoy your life because you hate school and you hate skating. So it's like, and then you're in the middle of nowhere, Michigan, and you're away from home. And so I was like, okay, well, it's got to be better than what I'm going through right now when I was reading your hidden opponent article there was a sentence in kind of like the middle the middle third and you were talking about just being a name on a roster and how you didn't want to feel like that how you didn't want to just feel like your contribution was within the confines of the rink why was that so important to you um I think it's and I guess I guess secondarily, where did you see the breakdown? I um at Adrian I felt like I was, you know, as in like the intercollegiate aspect, especially like I was a solid star. I didn't fall. I meddled when I needed to meddle and you know, I was just like, okay, like you're getting us points for the school. Like you will keep giving you just a little bit to like keep you going you know and not really like um personable like I wanted like a I always imagined like having a very personal relationship with my coach in college um just because I know that coaches are some of the most impactful people especially when you're an athlete like they cross your life and they teach you some of the most important life lessons and I had that growing up and I wasn't getting that in college when I went to Adrian and I just felt like I was in this routine of okay I would go to practice I would work on my soul skating and then I would go to synchro and I just kind of blended in and I I was scared of the coaches and I was scared to go to practice and I was scared to be around them so I just never felt like I was ever going to be enough and I was never going to be anything more than like Kenzie Brooke on Open Clear Day or you know um this girl who won us you know a juve medal at this competition and stuff like that and I is very clear and different from Adrian to try and I had the complete opposite spectrum when it came to that aspect. Did you feel safer in Trine's atmosphere, either mentally or physically? 100%. Like I was able to talk about my struggles. I was able to break it down. Um, I wasn't scared to talk to Rachel. Um, I It was easy for me to be vulnerable. It was easy for me to let her in on things that were going on in my personal life. And with skating, and um, it was a very positive culture for me, um, rather than like one that I just felt like I was being torn down. Um, and like we worked on my mental health for a long time. Um, and when I messed up in competition, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, you're never gonna skate again. It's like, I still love you. and it's okay and it's just like as a skater who did experience like toxic culture and toxic sure. coaching hearing that was like all I needed to like feel safe and feel heard and wanted and appreciated and more than just a number on a roster yeah speaking of falls which is a terrible segue. <laughs> I was reading 
December 2019, you fell on the ice and immediately were in excruciating pain. Yeah. Walk me through that process up until your diagnosis. So, like I said in that article, I took, I was back home. It was like over break after my first semester at Trine. And I took, I was going to try a jump that I hadn't tried in a while, but I was like, muscle memory, you know, um, went to go do it and fell on my hip and instantly just felt like this zing pain, um, like into my hip and so like my lower back, like hamstring area. I was like, man, I just should have jumped. I should have made that choice. Um, and then it just didn't get better. I, you know, didn't try to skate until I went back to trying. And then we had boot camp. I just kind of like skated through it. Um, I let Rachel know that I was like, I did something weird. I don't know what it is. Um, went to the athletic trainer. We kind of just like worked on like core strengthening exercises and things like that. Cause he didn't really know what was going on either. And then I went and saw the team doctor and, um, he was just saying like, well, let's like try and fix your posture and things like that. And like, maybe you should think about like, you know, taking a step back from skating. Cause like skating is a very, um, terrible spot sport on your body to say the least. Um, and like I was 20, 21 at that point, 2021, 20, I can't remember, but, um, you know, I was getting old in the world of figure skating. Um, I was like, okay, well, we'll just try, you know, keep doing PT, keep doing, playing, taking, I was taking so much ibuprofen, so much Tylenol. Um, I wasn't sleeping. Like I was just in constant pain from the second I woke up to the second I went to bed. And it's so hard for like someone to live like that and like I didn't want to go to class I got I was experiencing all these other symptoms and with that like I was losing a bunch of weight which wasn't helping you know the whole body image issue and like um that aspect of it and I was getting um and this was right before COVID hit I got a SI joint injection which is supposed to alleviate um the pain where I was like feeling it and it worked for about a month and then the pain came back and it was 10 times worse than what I was experiencing and like I was just having all these weird symptoms like when I would sneeze like it would hurt and like when I would cough it would hurt in what the other hip and like the pain would shift sides and um like I saw another orthopedic doctor just get like a second an opinion and he recommended like a spinal fusion, which is a very tough surgery, especially for someone who was only 21. Like it would have ended my skating career. It would have, you know, I would have probably had to had a correction surgery, like early 40s. Like it's just um would have limited like me uh mobility-wise. But I was so past the point of like feeling helpless and feeling like so lost um that I was like I was begging my mom to get the surgery like I was begging her I was like and my mom's a orthopedic nurse so she knew the surgery and knew how bad it was for me and it was like two weeks later I saw a rheumatologist because the last SI joint injection I got he recommended that I was way too young to experience this and something else wasn't going wrong something else was going wrong and I got a lot of blood tests and I actually tested positive for a rare blood gene called HLA B27 which um strongly links you to an autoimmune disease it's just like it just means you have a higher risk of developing them and it took my rheumatologist like 10 minutes sitting in a room and she was like, you either have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, it turns out I have uh, ankylosing spondylitis, which is a rare form of arthritis in the spine. But it's just crazy because I was going to sign up for a life-altering surgery. 
and uh, needless to say, it was an autoimmune disease. Um, but it's crazy that if I wouldn't have taken that fall, I probably wouldn't have noticed. And a lot of people go undiagnosed until they're like 40. And that's where you see, if you look up AS, you'll see people like hunched over in posture and they can't walk. Um, and that's how it progresses throughout life. And um, so I probably would have ended up in a situation like that. But thankfully with AS, the point of diagnosis is like pretty much the worst you'll ever be. So I'm like very thankful for skating in that aspect. Like it sucked and it sucked skating through pain and it sucked being in pain for 11 months. But if I wouldn't have taken that fall, then I wouldn't have found out that I had this disease and I wouldn't be able to manage it the way that I am. Wow. So you'll see up in the corner, we have a minute and 40 ish seconds. Once that timer ends, we'll get yeah. kicked out of the meeting, but the same link that got you into this one, we'll get you in again. We'll sign out we'll okay. come back, and we'll continue this conversation. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> but until that time, what was the diagnosis like when the rheumatologist told you that this was probably what was happening? What were you going through? Um, what was your immediate reaction? Like, oh my gosh, like, thankfully I have an answer and like, I'm not crazy. And like all these doctors, all these physical therapists I saw, even like, you know, my, like Rachel, my coach, she didn't know how to help me either. Like she wanted me, of course, to be healthy, but like she didn't, like no one could know what I was going through because like they couldn't feel my pain. But to hear someone say like, you have this disease and you actually have a diagnosis was like, it was so like relieving, even though like this was a diagnosis I was going to have to live with the rest of my life. Um, There's just no other like words to like put into perspective like oh my gosh like I have something and I'm not like crazy and it wasn't all for nothing you know did you know anyone with AS I mean is this a hereditary disease it is primarily like hereditary but as far as I know like my parents didn't have it um no one in my family had it um so it was new to all of us um it was uh there was these you know long list of side effects from the medication that they put you on um well you don't have to take it but um and there's no cure but this is what was the way to manage it and there's other way to manage it but um but yeah, I didn't know anyone. So I joined a bunch of Facebook groups, which was very scary because and probably something I shouldn't have done because um uh it is a lot of people who are like disabled and um I thought that was gonna like be my life and um so I got kind of scared and I I my heart breaks for like the people who didn't get an early diagnosis. Um but, and then I just, like, started sharing, like, my story, and I actually came across, like, a previous skater who had AS, which is just, like, crazy. I was, like, oh, my gosh, a skater, and she has AS. I, so, I, like, got to talk to her, like, we FaceTime, and, like, everyone is different with this disease, so it's hard to, like, paint it black and white, but um, she kind of, like, told me, like, her story, so I thought that was cool. And so um, I just tried to like bring like more awareness to this disease because um, a lot of people don't know what it is. And when I like told my family, they were like, ankylosing what? Like, what is this like long term for it? And even like my teammates and stuff. But um, but yeah, so I didn't know anyone. And but it's through like social media and a community where I was like able to cross paths with you know people and um even like forms like TikTok now like you just cross so many more people um nowadays so I think that's really like a positive social media is that you get to connect with people who think they're alone but they're not when you were joining those Facebook groups what was the 
general dem demographic of of these these people suffering um it you know it's it was you know parents who were joining for their kids it was you know a lot of 60 year olds like really suffering because of course like medicine has advanced so much than what it was 40 years ago um and then a lot of like early 20s um they say that it starts you know you start developing like symptoms and signs and i found this on the web for them and um that you can start developing those within like your early 20s late 20s um so it was like that it was like a mix of both so and it was just hard to see like it was hard to know what I was getting like myself into because I would read like okay what are all these people's side effects of this drug and you see people who um they get like complacent with it. I don't know if that's the right word, but you get complacent with the drug and then your symptoms actually return. Um, so I was scared of that. I was scared of, you know, the 1% chance of developing like cancer and like just all these like uh, things down the road that can impact you because of this drug. But then you see the people posting on there like, this drug changed my life and gave me a better quality of life and it's worth the risk you know that's worth the one percent chances or the scary big things they have to warn you of because you're doing this drug um but yeah so um it wasn't like a one-size-fits-all there either I saw people of all ages and all all demographics, male, female, all different types of races, and um, which was cool to see because um, you got to see everybody's stories. Um, and that's what I like hearing the most. Like, I like hearing um, the positive stories of people like overcoming things or just like having good days um, with the disease. So, when you were looking at skating through pain versus skating with a diagnosis what was the difference in your approach to those two situations um skating through pain um I think a lot of skaters will do it because you know you love skating and you don't want to let anyone down and so like that was my mentality which probably wasn't the best because I wasn't gonna let anyone down uh, and there were times even through like having my diagnosis, like especially my senior year, I was feeling like the weight of skating very heavily on my body and um, the impact of my disease as well. And there's like, there's no signs that are going to tell you like, okay, you're going to have a really good week with this disease or you're going to have a really bad few months. Um, and unfortunately, like I was getting into, um, flare-ups a lot my senior year and like I did have to sit out competitions and but I think I had like of course it still sucked and I had lots of conversations with teammates and my coach but I had to develop the mindset of I am not letting anyone down and I have a disability and it sometimes limits me and that's okay, and it's okay to take breaks because um, skating was very heavy on my sport or my body sport, but um, I think it's just like the mindset um, and developing like a strong mindset of it's okay to take breaks and it's okay to not be your best, um, but there's still ways you can positively like impact your teammates, and so like I looked at it more of like that way and of course it still sucked but um there's also like a lot of things you can't control in life and that was one of them that I couldn't what drug is it that you're on it's called Humira okay yeah yeah you've probably I've seen, seen commercials, I've seen for commercials it. For it. Yeah. yeah everyone in the commercials looks so happy yes <laughs> they do a great job of selling it I'm sure is there anything else that you think that I missed about your story? 
I am at the end of my questions. This is normally where I open it up to the guest to fill in any holes that I missed about your story and then additionally add anything that you think that I missed. Let me try to think. It's so hard because I am like the type of person who is like, I'll hang up the phone and then I'll like think of things. Um, but we do have a while until your episode airs. Okay. Um, if anything comes up between now and then, if you if we get off this and you think of something that that we miss talking about, DM me. I'll add it to the script. Okay. Really, um, not a big deal. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't think so. I just I'm a firm believer in like I will preach this and tell like I'm not involved in the skating world is like I hope that every skater who and I'm really passionate about collegiate skating but I know that like a lot of younger skaters go through mental health issues as well but I just want every skater to grow up in a healthy community community and like have that support system of a um, healthy environment a healthy culture and it does stem from the coach and the teammates do, I think, of course, play a role. But the skaters are going to learn from the coach. And I think um, skating as a whole will get a lot better. And once we start implementing, like, I think more restrictive, like, coaching, like, you see coaching issues, like, all over with safe sport and things like that, like, coaches getting in trouble for um, lots of other things besides toxic coaching, but um, I think once we can shy away from also the body image and the comparing skaters in a perspective, like, healthier way, I know it's always going to be a part of the sport, but I think once we can shy away from that, like the future generation of skaters are going to have a much healthier experience and not be scared to make mistakes, um, which is ultimately like no one wants to fall. No one wants to fall in competition. It sucks. But I think we have to fall to obviously get back up and like learn these life lessons beyond skating and I want every skater to realize that there's so much more beyond life than like skating and I wish I could have told myself that heading into my freshman year of college um is that you're gonna you're gonna hang up the skates one day and it's gonna be okay and you're gonna learn and you're gonna take all these life lessons that you've learn through skating and you're going to be able to apply them to like different areas of your life um and to not shy away from their story I'm a firm believer if like you have a story then use your voice to share it because there's going to be someone out there who has a similar story and if you are able to empathize with another human being that is like for me, the greatest joy that I could ever like give myself is to be able to share a story and have someone else feel the same way or find comfort within my story, whether it be similar or like completely opposite spectrum. But um, yeah, I'm a firm believer. Like if you have a voice and you have something to say, then say it because I feel like a lot of athletes don't say anything um, until like our mental health is down in the gutters Um, and whether it's you know toxic coaching eating disorders um, body image you know toxic teammates anything like that there's so many different areas of mental health that go into athletics that need to be talked about and um yeah, I think it's really cool what you're doing, too. Um, I love anything in regards to, like, mental health because um, it is a topic that is easily shied away from, so. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I, we are almost 100 episodes into this podcast, and 
every story has been so uniquely different. But at the same time, there are so many topics that I can almost guarantee like clockwork will come up. I mean, things like disordered eating and athlete identity and what happens after I'm not an athlete anymore. And all of these conversation topics that regardless of what side of the country you're on, or if you're in another country, if you're 18 or 45, these are these are struggles that we're always going to talk about. Yeah. And I think that if we can share one story and someone will find comfort or solidarity in in that story, I mean, I've done my job. 